All right, good morning, everybody. Um, today I have for you a talk about parsing signal from noise in a chaotic three-dimensional environment, uh, namely the detonation of a warhead. Um, it's a talk also about the value of new statistical methods in the field that has extreme difficulties with data collection um, and favors engineering solutions over statistical solutions. Uh, the material of the talk is, is technical, but the overall message that I want to present to you today is very simple. Um, there will be new methods for fragmentation data collection, and I will, I'll talk a little bit about those shortly. Uh, these include optical tracking or high-speed camera methods, um, but there will also be other methods that come along as well. If analysts want to keep up with these new data collection methods, then uh, we will also need new data methods that best utilize the incoming complex data. Um, in this briefing, uh, I will propose such methods. Um, but Ida is also working on statistical solutions to uh, a larger set of problems in live fire test and evaluation. So uh, this talk somewhat represents a first step in part of a much larger program. Um, So this is kind of a uh, overview of the data collection that um, I, I wanna present today. Um, in order to develop and evaluate a new munition, and this may be a warhead, a bomb, or otherwise, live fire events are conducted to measure the aspects of, of the detonation. There's many different aspects of the detonation that are considered uh, fragmentation, penetration, shock waves, and so on. The goal of a fragmentation event, which is the focus of this talk, is to observe fragments from a detonation. Ideally, we want to observe all of the fragments from a detonation, but in particular, we're interested in fragment mass, velocity, density, material type, and a few other types of fragment characteristics. Now, traditionally, data collection is conducted with an arena test, that's the left side of this chart, where the warhead is placed in an open arena and it is detonated. The fragments are collected in catch bundles on one side, and this allows us to say something about mass, frag mass, and electrostatic plates on the other side, which tell us about fragment velocity. This testing method is slow, it is costly, and it is statistically unappealing because raw fragmentation data are coarsened into bundles, and symmetry assumptions have to be made to extrapolate these characteristics. Uh, on the right side is an example of new data collection methods that are coming along. This is the optical tracking, aka high-speed uh, camera. These promise to improve data collection over catch bundles um, on the left. Um, and with the high-speed camera, we may be able to observe more fragments, but importantly, we will have better data, full 3D data, um, and higher resolution data, which will enable better analyses, but this is still emerging technology. The open question that I'll address is how do we analyze this new and complex data? Um, this is the gap that we want to fill in our research. Now, to fill this gap, we're going to propose uh, two sorts of analyses, and I call them the high-level analysis and the low-level analysis. And the reason for two analyses is to answer different research questions at different research levels. At the high level, we will propose a suite of exploratory data analysis techniques, and these let evaluators compare and contrast detonations and visualize multiple detonations at once. At the low level, we propose a novel method, which is inspired by work in another very chaotic domain, uh, namely climate and atmospheric modeling, to understand how important fragment characteristics change um, over the 3D view, the full 3D view of optically tracked data. And I want to emphasize uh, at this point that this is not simply for the statistician's enjoyment. Uh, improvements to statistical analysis directly translate to improvements in warhead evaluation, improvements in weaponeering, improvements in modeling and simulation, um, and so on, as higher fidelity data is translated into higher fidelity results. And that is essentially our goal. To demonstrate um, these approaches that I wanna introduce to you today, I, uh, I need some, some data to play with. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use data from the Extended Legacy Statistical Analysis System uh, called ELSA. And these data are provided by Thomas Hatch Aguilar at 
the Nav Air Weapons Division at China Lake. Uh, the data contained 25 simulated detonations of pipe bombs, and each simulated detonation is slightly different with different programmed case breakup dynamics. Uh, you'll see that some of the detonations are more different than others, and that's due to tweaks in computer code. Um, but most importantly, uh, these data represent a credible surrogate for real optical tracking fragmentation test data. Um, and we've only recently acquired um, optical tracking data, and they could not make it into the inclusion of this briefing. Um, but the plots in the upper right of this chart give you some teaser of what we are talking about, um, namely uh, three-dimensional fragmentation data um, with possibly a time component as we observe detonations um, evolve over some short period. Um, so we will propose uh, two, actually more, um, exploratory data analysis techniques for working with three-dimensional uh, complex data. Uh, one technique is the so-called energy goodness of fit test. And the purpose of this test is to determine if, if detonations are similar to one another. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on a later slide about why that may be important. Uh, data transformations are um, also useful for dealing with fragmentation data. And the point of data transformations in this domain is actually twofold. Uh, one is data transformations can help us understand the outcomes of uh, goodness of fit tests um, somewhat graphically. And they also allow us to talk about correlations between important fragmentation characteristics, such as mass and velocity. And these are um, important statistics that we previously did not get from conventional catch bundle arena tests. Um, this is an introduction to energy tests. If you're familiar with MNS validation, then you've encountered the komogorov smirnov test to determine if simulation data is similar to live data. The energy test is, in some sense, it's an extension of the chaos test to a multi-dimensional data problem. Um, it's, the energy test is inspired by physics, and it likens data to particles in space and measures a data-driven type of potential energy between them. Um, but this, we are not strictly speaking about a physical notion of energy when we talk about the energy test. Now, for explanation purposes, um, this is an example of two detonations with five black and three gray fragments. And the characteristics are, um, that are plotted are the mass and velocity of these fragments, but we are not limited um, to talking about the mass and velocity by any means. Um, on the left is an example of the energy test, finding a difference between two detonations. Um, the idea is that we measure the average between detonation distance, which is the dotted gray lines, and we compare it to the average within detonation distances, and those are the solid black lines. And then when, when the between distances overmatch the, with the within distances, the detonations are determined to be statistically different according to um, probably a bootstrapping procedure. On the right is a null difference. The average between and within detonation distances are roughly the same, um, which is to say that the solid black and dotted gray lines are on average, uh, they're roughly the same or they're, they're the same order of magnitude. The KS test that you may be familiar with is, it, it works well for one dimensional data, but the energy test works extremely well for multi-dimensional data. And um, it's completely non-parametric and to my knowledge, the most powerful way to detect differences between data clouds. Um, in our case, data clouds are uh, detonations from a series of warheads. So we apply the energy goodness of fit test to all 25 pipe bomb detonations that are in our collection of data from uh, the NAV Air Weapons Division. Each cell in this matrix represents a pairwise energy test comparison between two detonations. The compared detonations are marked on the X and Y axes of, of this uh, matrix plot. Now, we color each cell based on its pairwise similarity to other detonations. Uh, a dark red cell uh, indicates uh, dissimilarity between detonations, um, which statistically just means small p-value. Um, a blue cell means there's no evidence of dissimilarity, um, or aka large p-value, and white cells are indeterminate, which means the p-value is near 5%. And when we look at this matrix, patterns begin to emerge. So we can take rows and columns that are associated with a specific detonation and find outliers. And an outlier in this case is a pipe bomb detonation 
that is maximally dissimilar from other detonations. And we've, in this case, we find that detonations uh, 7, 22, and 23 are the most um, peculiar uh, based on this energy test, and therefore they deserve uh, further interrogation. In order to pull back the covers, uh, we recommend data transformations, which I mentioned previously. One such transformation is the uh, Box-Cox transformation, uh, although others may be useful as well. Uh, the idea is that we need to prepare the data for graphical analysis, and we want to compare detonations on the basis of simple statistics, namely means, variances, confidence intervals, and the like. Now, means and variances are most representative when the data are symmetric. So some sort of transformation that brings highly skewed data close to symmetry uh, is, is needed if we want means and variances to be somewhat uh, less misleading uh, when we compare detonations. Uh, Pearson's correlation, which you're familiar with from Stats 101, this is also a more honest statistic when the data are symmetric. Uh, and, a, and an argument further in favor of data transformations. The graph in the middle shows what marginal mass and velocity looks like in the pipe bomb detonation. Velocity is symmetrically distributed, uh, but mass is somewhat right skewed. So a Box-Cox transformation acts on both of the axes to pull the data towards normality, uh, which is sometimes successful and sometimes not. The outcome of, a transform of one such transformation is in the lower right corner. Um, you can tell that the data is brought towards symmetry, but it is still non-normal, um, although it's not grossly misleading to think of this data as somewhat normal data. Um, this is also an important transformation when we get into data modeling because uh, it frees us from having to worry about skewness and kurtosis and other uh, strange things that can make models somewhat unrepresentative of the data that they're trying to uh, simplify. Excuse me. Uh, using the transformation, uh, we plot the means and confidence intervals of all mass and velocity pairs. Now, the energy test outliers from the previous uh, slide with the matrix, these are colored in blue on the slide and other detonations are colored in gold. Now the graph shows a cone-shaped pattern. Uh, this means variability between, small de uh, between detonations is small when average fragment mass is small. And as average fragment mass increases, variability uh, of detonations increase as well. The graph characterizes why the energy test selects outliers. Um, in particular, detonation 22 has a high average velocity, uh, but it's on the lower end of mass, um, average frag mass. And similarly, 23 has a low average velocity. Um, detonation seven is somewhat remarkable in terms of both, both average mass and average velocity and its difference from other clusters, AKA collections of, of detonations. Um, Graphing in this case is also important because it reveals that there's no correlation between frag mass and frag velocity. And this is because the data are computer generated, but in the real world, we have the power to actually detect correlations between numeric characteristics that are collected um, on various uh, detonations. Um, so that's... Uh, half my talk, which summarizes some of the high level analyses that we propose. And uh, there are some other aspects to it as well, but in the interest of time, I kind of gave you the top two. Um, next, I'd like to sort of talk about the low level model. And this gives a deeper insight into individual uh, fragmentation events. So previously I was showing you statistics that are useful for the collection of, of detonations. In, in our case, we have 25 uh, pipe bombs, but for any other test, you should have uh, at least three, um, possibly five uh, detonations um, in a fragment event. Um, now, what I wanna do is move into statistics that are useful for characterizing detonations uh, in their own right. So in order to supply the most honest inference uh, to full 3D fragmentation data, we uh, use a a spatial convolution model. 
And this is like a Gaussian process regression, if you are familiar with those. But the convolution model is somewhat computationally easy for my dinky laptop. Um, we use this model because we want to respect the geometry of the detonation, and we want to model as flexibly as is necessary, given the nature of the data. This convolution model has two purposes, um, and it differs from our previous work in EDA. Um, number one is we want to provide evaluators with insight into complex 3D fragmentation data. Um, and we want to make it easy to characterize detonations uh, that are somewhat noisy and, and strange looking. We also want to provide uh, not really a, I wouldn't call it a replacement, but um, a, 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 it's a more like a functional replacement for a standard Z data file format. And this is sort of the course data reduction uh, that is done in a traditional arena test. Um, it coarsens the data in a way that leads to unreplicable variability in modeling and simulation. And our idea is to uh, replace this binned data uh, with what is a circular smooth. And this puts, uh, puts us in a more optimal region of the bias various variance trade-off. Um, if you're interested in the mathematics here, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to uh, display them. And rather, I'll show you uh, pictures that summarize some of the critical outcomes. Um, and I, I'd like to sort of walk you through a couple examples from uh, simple to complex to kind of give you some idea of what I mean by circular smoothing. So let's start with a contrived example. So this is a warhead detonation, uh, which resulted in 18 fragments. Okay, so it's fake, but um, it does the job in terms of illustration. Um, so let's start by not plotting the fragments in three dimensions. So this is a two dimensional graph of the fragments. Now, um, the axes of the graph show that the data were collected uh, in relation to uh, the nose of the warhead, which is at zero degrees. And in the case of these data, we made observations 20 feet from the detonation. So this is both a snapshot in time and it is a spatial simplification of the full data problem, uh, which I'll show you at the end of the talk. Um, now, to make things simpler, uh, let's just consider one fragmentation characteristic. And uh, what I want you to think about um, is the velocity of each of these 18 fragments that are emanating from uh, this uh, 18 frag pipe bomb. Now we can graph the velocity of each of these fragments as a distance from the origin in this plot. And in this case, there are high velocity fragments in the lower right quadrant of the plot. So coming off the right side of the nose, and there are lower velocity fragments in the uh, upper in the uh, upper right quadrant. Okay. And this is what a spatial convolution model looks like when it is fit to our 18 fragment data set. So notice that it respects the geometry of the detonation. Uh, rather than computing a linear fit through the data, we achieve a circular fit uh, by rotating the input around 360 degrees. Uh, the main feature here is interpolation. So the pink line shows a fitted expected velocity function, and this changes smoothly as we rotate around the warhead. Um, also notice that since the data are circular, there is, in some sense, no such thing as extrapolation. So we're interpolating between two points at all times. Um, the confidence intervals, which could also be called credible intervals, show our uncertainty in the mean velocity subject to the flexible constraints of the model. Notice that in areas where there are no fragments, which is not uncommon in real data, uh, the uncertainty expands to show that we know less rather than that we know nothing. So this model allows us to make inferences about expected velocity through confidence intervals, which are the green uh, lines, uh, or about new data using prediction intervals, which are the yellow lines. Of note, a Z data, zonal data type analysis here uh, would have us bucket the data. And this forces an uncomfortable decision about how to uh, choose cut points and trade off bias, bias for variance. However, this is mostly standard practice. Um, to give an example, uh, let's just sort of talk about setting up a scenario where a warhead detonates around and it's surrounded by objects. Um, 
let's just illustrate this by how it works by supposing that an object is located near the tail of a warhead, which is 200, say 225 degrees in our circular view. Um, to conduct inference, we will conduct, we will basically take a radial cross section of the posterior distribution and interrogate that radial cross section. So in this case, we take the 250 degree, the 225 degree cross section, and we can calculate exceedance probabilities, such as what is the probability that the velocity will exceed uh, 4,000 feet. And in this case, it turns out to be um, 98%. It's a simple example, but modeling and simulation designers can use these um, figures like these to increase fidelity, avoid loss of information, and make optimal uh, decisions as well. The real magic here is that we are balancing um, bias and variance trade-off in a way that is Bayesianly optimal. Um, we do this by controlling the standard deviation of a kernel that smooths around the data. So these images show different versions of Bayesian spatial fits um, to the same data set. The left shows an image where the kernel does not sufficiently smooth the data, so things are overfit. Uh, on the right, this kernel standard deviation is, is too, um, it's too large and the resulting uh, spatial fit is uh, somewhat underfit or over smoothed, depending on um, how you say things. Um, both of these are obviously bad, um, but the news is that there's usually a happy medium. And uh, we do that, we actually find that medium uh, iteratively uh, by maximizing a marginal evidence uh, statistic. Um, this is essentially like cross validation. Um, so if you're familiar with that, then um, you're probably uh, right at home thinking about uh, tuning a hyperparameter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the ELSA data um, before we get to the end here. And uh, this is a graph of sort of 1,200 fragments uh, from a pipe bomb explosion. Um, the graph shows that there's a large collection of fragments coming off the nose. And the highest velocity emanates from the sides of the warhead at 90 and 270 degrees. This is common, and this is a pattern that is called a beam spray. Uh, th these are actually 3D data, but um, for illustrative purposes, I've sort of put it in a 2D projection. Now we'll save the 3D for the end of the talk. And this is the result of the spatial convolution model fit to these, uh, 3D data, to these uh, 2D data. It's a smooth circular model fit, and it summarized the velocity distribution at any radial point around the warhead. The model reflects what we see in the data, which bolsters the model's believability. As before, the pink line represents the posterior mean of the data. Uh, it is highest in the beam spray, but there is a depression in the nose at zero degrees, and there's a peak in the tail at 180 degrees. And you'll notice now that the uh, green confidence intervals are uh, very skinny. And that's because as we gather more fragments, um, we gain more certainty about where the mean velocity is as a function of wrapping around the warhead. Uh, to show what exactly what kind of improvement this is, um, I want to compare the spatial convolution model to the conventional Z data zonal data summary for detonation uh, number seven. On the right is the spatial convolution model. Um, it is a smooth, uh, smooth model. It's flexible to the circular nature of the data. Uh, it's well calibrated, and it, it does not assume any symmetry about any axis. So uh, rather few assumptions. The, the left plot, um, on the other hand, shows a, it's a zonal Z data summary for this detonation. And if you're a statistician, you can consider this like a model, but things are bucketed into 15, uh, five or 10 degree buckets. Rather than a distribution that leverages data across buckets, uh, this coarsens the data and it results in very highly variable um, statistics. The medians are shown in blue and the means are, are I'm sorry, the min and the max are shown uh, in red. Um, this is a high variance summary. It's uh, somewhat not well calibrated to the data, and it's not something you would expect to replicate. But as a data table, it suits a purpose. However, it leaves information on the table um, because we, um, we may presume that uh, the velocity at 50 degrees is similar to the velocity at 55 degrees and, and very dissimilar from the velocities at 180 degrees. 
uh, th these types of things are um, subject matter knowledge that if we can use in our models, then we should use them. And that's exactly what we do in our spatial smoothing. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the sort of the full 3D. So this is kind of the climax of, of the talk. And previously I was showing you 2D data, but this is the, um, the sort of full 3D application. So we are not very fortunate in three dimensions um, compared to two. Graphing the data does not help very much. So if, and this is just a graph of sort of positional data from a pipe bomb explosion. Um, if we rotate the graph, we might understand some of the patterns in the data, but the utility of sort of 3D plotting is still somewhat limited. Um, this is a scatter graph of, of positional data. And despite my attempts to improve the plot with color, um, it indicates that, um, uh, sorry, improving it with a color that indicates uh, uh, distance from the center of the pipe bomb, it's, it's rather hard to make sense of this positional data. Um, and this is before we even can start to consider the important uh, fragmentation data characteristics um, that we glean from a fragmentation event, um, namely mass, velocity, uh, and, and, and density. Um, so the question is, uh, we wanna use a model to understand these characteristics, all right? And that's what I'm gonna show you on, on the next slide. So uh, these are our spatial convolution models to the data. Um, from detonation number seven uh, in full 3D glory. So uh, this is how we're sort of better able to understand fragment properties. Now, this is a natural extension of what you saw on the previous slides. Um, it's just now we move from 2D to the 3D spherical model. And in each case, I'm showing you a different subset of an important fragmentation property. Um, it goes fragmentation velocity, mass, and density on the far right. Now, for ease of plotting, um, I'm showing the predicted characteristics and I'm hiding the confidence and prediction intervals, but those are readily available as well. Um, and you'll notice that for each characteristic, we learn something different and surprising, um, which really shows you that there is value in trying to understand complex data. So um, for frag, frag velocity, this is what I call the square donut. Average velocity is depressed at the, at the nose and tail. Um, but there is an apparent beam spray, and the magnitude of the beam spray changes radially um, as you move orthogonal to the nose. Now, this, is, this results in the, the square space. For mass, uh, which we actually use the Box-Cox data for, um, there is John, a depression. Excuse me, John, sorry. Uh, we have, you have a couple, uh, if we could wrap this up, that'd be great. We gotta start the next session. Thank you. Okay, um, anyway, each of the shapes are different. Um, I'll just give you my conclusions here. Uh, we need better data methods. Um, optical tracking is going to um, challenge us. And so we need to be thinking about how we're going to analyze this data. And there are going to be big ramifications. Um, if we can improve data fidelity uh, and figure out how to carry that forward, then we will be um, treating the data optimally in some, some sense. So I'd ask the community to continue to think about ways to treat complex data uh, without throwing away information. Thank you.